Hello everyone, my name is Tracy Gill and I'd like to welcome you to the fourth talk in the FY21 NOAA Environmental Leadership Seminar Series. The goal of these seminars is to showcase NOAA's leadership in environmental science by those who lead it and make it happen. I'd like to take a few minutes for webinar details. First, I'd like to thank the NOAA Research Council and the awesome team I work with in producing these seminars, without whom none of them would happen. Fernand Garcia with the NOAA NESDIS National Centers for Environmental Information, Sandra Clare with the NOAA NESDIS Office of the Deputy Chief Administrative Officer, and Katie Rowley with the NOAA Office of Ocean and Atmospheric Research and the NOAA Central Library. Here are a few seminar logistics. Most are listed, listed in the Q&A pod. All attendees are muted, so please type all questions and comments into the Q&A box at any time, and we will address them at the end. We are recording this seminar, and the recording and PDF of the oh, and the recording will be made available within a few days at the link provided in the chat box. Please note, as the recording and chat notes will be available online, if you submit a question to the chat Q&A box, your name, representing your likeness, will be recorded and shared. We often have staffers assist us for the NOAA Leadership Seminar Series during the Q&A, and today Robin Zerwinski and I will moderate the Q&A. If your system seems to be lagging, please turn off any extra apps you might have on. Also, you might want to watch this webinar in full screen or larger view. To do this, find the four arrow button to the upper right corner of the slides, and that four arrow button toggles the full screen view on and off. Looking ahead to next month's uh, NOAA Environmental Leadership Seminar, Irene Parker, Assistant Chief Information Officer for NOAA's National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service, or NESDIS, office, will present on February 9th. You can visit the NOAA Environmental Leadership Series webpage at the link listed in the Q&A pod, and all our past webinars are listed there. We are working to schedule the rest of our speakers for FY21. And so today's seminar is titled Shifting Sands, Leadership in a Time of Change. And our speaker is Nicole LaBeouf, the Acting Assistant Administrator and Permanent Deputy Assistant Administrator for NOAA's National Ocean Service, or NOS. And here's some background on her. Nicole provides strategic vision needed to lead the implementation of activities that support NOS's priorities of safe and efficient transportation and commerce, preparedness and risk reduction, and stewardship, tourism, and recreation. Nicole serves as the focal point for conveying the value of NOS products and services within NOAA and to the Department of Commerce, the Office of Management and Bu Budget, and Congress. Growing up on the Texas Gulf Coast, Nicole can't recall a time in her life when she didn't want to be around more, or more deeply understand or protect the ocean. Her profound connection to the coast makes her work at NOS all the more meaningful and fuels her commitment to the mission to protect and sustain coastal communities. Nicole's past passion for science and ocean stewardship are equally matched by her dedication to public service. Nicole has dedicated over 20 years of public service to NOAA's mission, leading various parts of the organization during pivotal times, including a sorry, I'm having a including serving as finance lead during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Nicole has represented NOAA at the UN General Assembly and the World Conservation Union, Union regarding the protection of deep sea corals. Nicole holds a bachelor's degree in marine biology from Texas A&M University and a master's degree in sustainable development and conservation biology from the University of Maryland. She is also a proud graduate of NOAA's Leadership Competencies Development Program. Nicole lives with her husband, stepchildren, and a handsome hound dog in Kensington, Maryland. And with that, Nicole, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tracy. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to Tracy, Hernan, Sandra, Katie, and everyone else who makes today's seminar and the series possible. Hold on, Nicole. Oh, we're, I'm sorry, we are missing your um, video cam. And somehow, we have somebody else on video cam. Sorry about that. How is that now, Tracy? You look great and you sound great. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's try this again. Thank you to Tracy, Hernan, Sandra, and Katie, and everyone else who make this series possible. I uh, really appreciate all the work that you put into it. I am so very grateful and honored to be here today and to have this time with you. 
And because I can't actually see your faces, I will have to use my imagination to reassure myself that you're all actually out there, that you're safe, and that you're doing all you can to muster up some hope and maybe what looks like a smile as we embark on this time together today. It has definitely been a disturbing and disheartening few days, weeks, months, and years, and it will take some time and our collective resolve to get our nation back on track. I know that we will, but it will take time, and it will take us all working together to do that. With that, I will begin today's message, sorry, today's remarks, with words that are more often associated with my written all-hands messages at NOS, steady as we go. So if you've read the introduction and you listened to uh, my intro from Tracy today, you have some idea of what I'm going to talk about and a little bit about me. Um, but because of today's wider audience, I'm not going to assume that you know uh, how I came to NOAA. So I did grow up on the Texas Gulf Coast, as Tracy indicated. I grew up hunting, fishing, crabbing, bird watching, and I grew up in a family where we threw pretty much anything in a stock pot that didn't swim, fly, or scamper away fast enough. My childhood wasn't always easy, but somewhere in there I decided to be a marine biologist, which I did at Texas A&M University at Galveston, where I specialized in marine mammals. Then sometime there, on a dare, I applied for a job and got it moving from Texas to Maryland to work for the National Marine Fishery Service in 1997. For over 19 years, I mostly worked to reduce the bycatch of protected species. Over half of that time, I traveled the world, negotiating the implementation of international fisheries treaties. For much of the other half, I developed regulations implementing the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. I was a regulator through and through. I enjoyed it and I was good at it. But I did more than promulgate regulations and treaty provisions. At every turn, I took opportunities to add to the tools in my toolbox. With nearly four years of my time spent at NOAA Fisheries on, career, on my career development doing detail assignments. You've heard me speak before about my career path at NOAA. You may recall that it's been a windy one, full of a wide range of seemingly disparate experiences. You may also recall, recall that I believe that the disparate nature of these experiences, while they didn't feel interconnected at the time, that have all added essential tools to my toolbox, a phrase you're going to hear me use throughout these remarks. So this brings us to the last four years, my first four years as an SES, this being the shifting sands of my career. Lucky me. So midway through 2016, again on a dare, I applied for the job of the Deputy Assistant Administrator, or DAA, of the National Ocean Service. I had no expectations of actually getting the job, but I had never applied for an SES position before, so I figured that was a good enough reason to try. Lo and behold, I did get the job. And although I'd become accustomed to moving around within NOAA fisheries, leaving NIMS altogether to join the ranks of NOS and to join the SES car, poor, was really hard. I felt as if I was leaving all that I was good at, my subject matter expertise, and my friends and colleagues. Indeed, the work of NOS is very different from that of NOAA Fisheries. I knew that when I made the switch, but what I didn't know was whether the skills and tools I came over with would be handy in the new gig. My first day at NOS was December 11, 2016, and the sand beneath my feet hasn't stopped shifting. Honestly, between you and me, it's felt as if the rug has been pulled out from underneath my feet over and over again since I arrived at NOS. I'm not going to go into all of it, but it suffices to say that over the last four years, I've experienced significant personal turmoil and loss, competition and undermining by my peers, sexism, even at this level, in addition to professional challenge, instability, and uncertainty, the likes of which, which I did not think possible. Mm -hmm. And along with everyone else, I've endured an onslaught of insults to the very notion of federal service, unparalleled political divisiveness, civil unrest, a pandemic, and now an attack on our very own capital, when all we wanted to do was take care of our great nation. 
In particular, 2020 was rough. I don't have to tell you that. And if there was one thing we could predict about 2020, it was that it was inherently unpredictable. For the biologists and our virtual audience, I don't have to tell you that unpredictability is hard on the system. And I just don't mean, I'm not talking about the structural or governance systems such as our democratic institutions, although they've certainly been pushed to their limits. I'm referring to the personal system, our physiology and our psycho excuse me, our psychology. Any stress physiologist or even primatologist will tell you that not knowing what comes next is harder on the body than knowing what comes next, even when that something is bad. In other words, the certainty of a bad outcome is easier for most intelligent creatures to cope with than uncertainty itself. The events of 2020 and those that have spilled into 2021 were filled with uncertainty, as well as fear, anger, grief, confusion, political rancor, violence, and my new SAT word, sedition. My body's reaction to all of this has been I grew a lot of gray hair in 2020, and I gained a few pounds, like I think a lot of us. 2020 is over, but our nation remains unsettled, and the impacts will likely be with us for some time. Unexpectedly, and perhaps like 2020 vision, the year 2020 for me, and quite possibly many of you, was and now continues to be about personal reflection as well. I've reflected on a great many things, and now in the public space of my home office, I have reflected on what it has meant to lead in OS in these unprecedented times. For me, leading in OS has meant standing out on a shaky limb at times, and yet being fierce in the defense of NOS's mission and its people. It has meant trusting the NOS workforce and demanding that their expertise and authorities be treated with the respect that they deserve. It has meant mustering the courage, the thoughtfulness, and a positive disposition every day to offer an example of resilience that others could follow. It has meant for me and perhaps you being forced to deal with the consequences of a range of assaults to our bodies and our spirits, whether as public servants, as people of color, as women, or as patriots. There was no script or rule book for how to get through the challenges of 2020, no, nor those that persist today. There was certainly no guidance on being in a leadership role at NOAA, so yes, I spend a fair bit of time wondering if I have what it takes to lead an organization as varied and as highly specialized as NOS in such turbulent times. Without a doubt, NOS has the most diverse missions across all of the Nova Line offices. One minute I'm talking about coral reef restoration, the next about precision navigation. I'll get briefed on the U.S. survey foot and then on our response to an oil spill. I'll be speaking with engineers about the effects of coastal development on marshes, then representatives of the reinsurance industry about calculating the risk of coastal change on their multi-billion dollar portfolios. Glider deployments and hurricanes, the blue economy, and much more. And yet none of these topics are remotely within my area of expertise. None of them. I've heard NOS characterized as a holding company, not organized for the purpose of doing any one thing, but rather doing many different things. That's not entirely untrue. Parts of NOS go back to the days of Thomas Jefferson, while other NOS programs stormed onto the scene as a part of the environmental movement of the 1970s. Each NOS program has a rich and distinct history and a strong sense of purpose and identity. NOS AAs have been challenged throughout the years to appreciate the various programs, cultures, stakeholders, and specializations of profound innovation and value. I can tell you that more than one former NOSAA has strongly counseled me to not even try to learn the entire organization. I've also heard that those who do try will burn out, and that the various NOS programs are just too different to see their connections to one another. These former NOSAAs weren't wrong based on their own direct experiences, and there is much insight and wisdom in what they told me but the times they are changing. No longer can NOS or any other NOAA line office continue to operate entirely within silos, not when the Earth's processes don't, and not when the Earth is insisting that we pay attention. 
as the impacts of climate change become much more than distant looming threats, I've come to see NOS through a very different lens, a lens that is familiar to me as it's familiar as, as it's also similar to a window through which I have seen myself. I've come to view NOS as not merely a holding company, but as more of a Swiss Army knife, a multi-use tool, with each very different program being the best at what it does. Put them all together in one device, tuck it in your pocket, and you've got what you need to solve a multitude of life problems. Before coming to NOS, I would have probably described myself as a toolbox full of different useful gadgets, but after leading and learning from NOS over the last four years in particular, I'd say that either a, a toolbox or a Swiss Army knife is an apt description of us both, me and NOS. Perhaps even NOAA, when it comes to preparing our nation for the impacts of climate change, be they shifting sand or something else. And it's not just about having tools, putting them in your pocket or a box. It's about knowing how and when to use them, individually, in combination with one another, and in combination with others' tools. At NOAA and perhaps at NOS and perhaps across NOAA, it's about ensuring that there are seamless transitions between one product and another, adapting to using user needs that change in order to retain ourselves as a premier authoritative source of decision support for our nation's climate change preparation. Sure, we still need org charts, but the lines around and between boxes must begin to represent not just individual functions, but flexible, integrated, collaborative conversations, as well as highly adaptable product and service handoff. And since this is a leadership seminar, let's spend some time tying this to some leadership concepts. When I'm asked what I believe to be my most important leadership attribute, I usually respond to, or usually respond with what is called in leadership parlance as style switching or style flexing. Also sometimes called situational leadership, these terms refer to one's ability to adjust your personality style in order to interact with others. It can also mean making changes to your man managerial style or your communication style with the goal of make, meeting the needs of those around you. When style flexing, you adapt and adjust the application of your own traits, fine-tuning your approach and your expectations based on your understanding of the workplace personality style of others. Those who study leadership know that effective leaders do not employ a static or best leadership style. Rather, good leadership is more situational and should be fluid and adaptable by meeting people and situational requirements where they are. I have found that style flexing is especially helpful in addressing highly complex and diverse challenges where the leadership landscape is frequently changing. In theory, anyone can be a successful and effective leader as long as they are in tune with the present situation, allow their style to be flexible, and participate alongside the people they are leading. I believe this same approach will help redefine NOS and perhaps NOAA as an even more innovative and responsive organization, although not an altogether different one, more like a living, learning organism. Think of the intellect of an octopus. It's not a different animal under different circumstances. It still has internal organs that carry out specialized functions and retain its overall cephalopod standing. However, its unique intelligence and its ability to respond to changing circumstances is embedded within its skin and its limbs. It adapts its shape, color, and texture to that which is needed for success in a changing environment. This may be what style switching looks like to an octopus. In humans, what makes style switching and situational leadership possible is not that we have cognitive function in our arms and legs, although that would be cool, but that we can purposefully and eagerly attain a wide variety of tools in our toolbox, along with a keen awareness of when to use each one, when to combine them, and when to connect with the tools of others. If our power was in our individual skills or tools, we'd all be nothing more than holding companies. But our power as leaders is much greater 
is we consider ourselves, our colleagues, and our organizations as having shared toolboxes when we interact with one another and with those who depend on us. Increasingly, I believe that our worth as a whole will be more than the sum of our parts because we will know how and when to use those parts as data, technology, and demand signals change. This can be, I believe, NOS's and possibly NOAA's superpower, particularly as we prepare our nation for the impacts of climate change. At the top of my list is sea level rise and coastal inundation. A purposeful and strategic willingness to adapt to changing conditions and to transform myself and NOS to meet a changing future is something that I never expected we'd have in common when I started as the DAA four years ago. Today, it fills me with resolve and optimism about our future together. And it makes me dream of greater things for all of NOAA. Before I discuss a few leadership traits that I think are essential to realizing one's leadership toolbox potential, I'm going to talk about why crisis-driven leadership doesn't always capture everyone's value or contribution. I'm also going to touch on recent findings about desired and expressed traits of leaders during a crisis relative to men and women. And then I'm going to draw a connection between leading with and without crises and examine traits common between them that I believe, with practice, we can all use to good effect. First, why crisis-driven positional leadership doesn't speak to everyone. There are a zillion books and articles on leadership that will tell you what the traits of a leader are or should be or by example have been. Many of these books and articles, although not all of them, use crisis-based, power-dynamic, conflict-driven case studies to build up the tension and illustrate why a particular leadership concept or approach can save the day. I appreciate why that's done, but these books and articles don't always resonate with me, especially those in which the case studies are largely about national or military leaders or football coaches. These situations no doubt offer opportunities for leaders to shine, but they aren't relatable to most women, nor to the myriad of people who don't follow sports, nor to those who do not risk their lives in war. And the kinds of decisions made in high-profile acute crisis and positional leadership situations are not necessarily decisions that so many other leaders would make. Most leading doesn't happen in a crisis although we've been recently settled with some big fat exceptions, and I will get to that. Most leading happens every day in the small and quiet moments, sometimes when no one's looking and often in the absence of positional authority or a conflict that's come to a head. Most effective leading doesn't let it get to that, and most leaders don't receive public recognition or get their name in the history book. Leading is often being collaborative, looking out for others' interests along with your own, and considering relationship building and trust as key measures of success. Moreover, inclusive leadership leads with shared objectives, collective problem solving, and generosity, not brute strength in the throes of battle. To be clear, I do not wish for you to take from this portion of today's seminar anything that looks or feels like men versus women nor do I not humbly acknowledge the sacrifices that have been made on the battlefield for my freedom. That's not where I'm coming from at all. And I will get back to crisis leadership. But what I wish to convey is that I believe many folks are still playing that same old record about what a leader is or should be when we could be broadening our view of the traits and qualities of more inclusive leadership, whether we're in a crisis or not. That's why we've got to let more kinds of leaders into the conversation, men, women, and everyone in between, so that we have more than one or two seats at the table, and so that those new to leadership roles have a voice, even if their voice is unfamiliar at first. Lifting all voices will facilitate a deeper appreciation for what a more diverse workforce can bring to leadership roles, not just in an opinion and quality, but in style, expertise, background, perspective, and more. For all of the hardship that the year 2020 brought, it also called upon some of my most valued and yet potentially non-traditional leadership traits 
traits not discussed in many leadership books, articles, and conventional case studies. In addition to integrating flexibility, as already discussed, 2020 refreshed my love of empathy, imposter syndrome, humanity, and permission to take downtime, the ever-elusive work-life balance so critical for personal resilience. Let's start with empathy, a leadership trait that is becoming more appreciated and accepted. Those of you who consider yourself empathetic or who strive to be know that it isn't about being a bleeding heart all the time or letting people walk all over you. It's about walking together with someone, really listening, considering their needs and interests, and it works from any position within an organization. It may not come natural to you to let others in, but the only downside I see to being empathetic is that when others hurt, you might feel some of it too. I'd advise feeling empathy, but not taking on others' problems as if they were your own, unless there is something you can and should do to make a positive difference. If that's the case, then go for it. But empathy is a skill. It's a tool in the toolbox, and it takes practice to do it well. With what seemed like a lack of empathy in the world in the year 2020, I ended up leading NOS empathetically more than I could have ever imagined. I believe that empathy is exactly what's been called for under the circumstances, as I spent much of my time opening lines of communication up, down, and across NOS so that people knew they'd be listened to, whether about the pandemic, the civil unrest, the difficulties of working from home, or the recent tragedies in D.C. Leading with empathy has brought me closer to the people and the mission of NOS and has reminded me that we're all in this together. I will provide a link to a blog I wrote about this a while back at the end of these remarks, so I guess you'll have to stick around for that. Next, imposter syndrome. How on earth is this the desired trait of a leader? Well, it is and it isn't, and I'll bet most of us have had it. That is, felt like at some time in our lives that we were an imposter. For me, imposter syndrome is much less pronounced than it used to be when I was younger and less confident in myself. And because it's been a part of me for a while, I've learned to use it to my advantage. I've learned to reframe the typical imposter inquiry, do you even know what you're doing? To sound more like, is what you're doing right now adding value? In doing so, I've turned imposter, imposter syndrome into the secret weapon of non-judgmental scrutiny. And in doing so, it's been one of my best allies and situation features. It would be easy to feel like an imposter and to get caught up in a negative spiral around the reality facing me as the leader of NOS right now, some of them being that I'm still learning NOS and may never, probably will never, master it all, that I'm the youngest of the AA, that I'm the only woman serving as AA, that I've been an acting AA since August 2018, that I've served now with five, soon to be six, acting DAAs, that the last three presidents' budget have cut NOS by over 40%, and then the year 2020 brought entirely new challenges. These are just facts, and they aren't all inherently bad facts, but they have made it harder for me to do my job on a daily basis. So I have to keep wallowing from my, keep myself from wallowing in these facts as if I don't have a right to be here, because that's imposter syndrome. But if you flip it upside down, I realize that doing the job well has been important enough to me to ask myself that question about adding value every day, so that I was never on autopilot. And as a result, I've done whatever I thought was needed for NOS in that moment, that week, or that month, depending on where the stance had shifted. 2020 was not the best year for long-term strategic leadership development, but it did teach me invaluable lessons about being responsive to an organization's needs, about finding the right tools in my toolbox and putting them to use whatever was going on. Next up is humanity. Humanity is a big word, and to me, and in this context, it simply means be a freaking human, publicly, mindfully, authentically. It means make mistakes, laugh, apologize, forgive yourself and others. 
forget where the mute button is, misplace the chat window, and move on. In that respect, the year 2020 made us all more human. Now that we can see into one another's homes, meet our coworkers' kids, and marvel in everyone's homemade haircut or lack thereof. And I have to say, y'all, I'm from Texas, so my hair is just going to keep getting bigger. COVID-19 has tested the humanity in everyone, in not only those that it's taken from us, but in making it more okay than ever before to let your best be enough. So, ease up on yourselves, all you high performers. You know who you are. And kudos to everyone who's remained patient and compassionate with others as they've all become, as we've all become acquainted with one another's risk tolerance levels, knowing now that they are spread widely along a spectrum. No one is wrong to be afraid of a deadly virus. Indeed, we have all found that we are unexpectedly clawing at Maslow's hierarchy of needs as we keep ourselves and our loved ones safe and educated, as we cancel vacations and time with family, and as we keep Noah's mission going strong. If that ain't leadership, I don't know what else it is. Well, there's one more, work-life balance. Although in a pandemic, it feels a lot like the work-life semi-permeable membrane. And as turning off work is harder than ever before, it's also more important than ever. We all know that, but are we doing that? Do we have examples of leaders doing that? Or are we singing from the same old song sheet that leaders shouldn't stop working ever, no matter when or what, they're always on call, always on email? That's exhausting just to think about. And as a stepmom to an amazing teenage girl, I will be present for my family when the day is done. Perhaps most importantly, Leaders that don't chillax signal to the workforce that no one has permission to prioritize their families or hobbies or whatever else fills them up. So wherever, whether you're married, single, have kids, don't, have hobbies, pets, whatever you do, we all have lives outside of Noah, and we will all be better at our jobs when we are fulfilled outside of them, always. I know it's easier said than done, and there will be exceptions, but it's well worth doing, not only for yourself, but perhaps more importantly, for those who may be taking cues from you. You and those around you will need to be rested and ready for the next emergency. And there will be one or more on the way. So take some downtime and welcome to my definition of leadership. Downtime. All right. Now, let's test the possible interactions between these two concepts, the traditional positional crisis-driven leadership traits and non-traditional, more inclusive, more real human leadership traits, which in some crises may prove to be more important when employees are already at the end of their ropes. Just a few days ago, a young woman on my team sent to me an article from Harvard Business Review, a source that I have found both useful and not for the reasons I've already described, but that I still go to for nuggets of wisdom. The article was entitled, Research, Colon. Women are better leaders during a crisis. Now, before you jump to any conclusions, I do not subscribe to the notion that men or women are better leaders. I believe that we are frequently different and may do better or worse in a given situation. But such a sweeping statement is not likely true and certainly not inclusive. A title like this may grab more readers, but it doesn't tell the whole story, so I reject the premise of the tagline. That said, there's information in this article that I did find insightful if you open your mind a bit to what it might actually mean. The article, reporting on recently released research using the pandemic as an example of a crisis, described a study in which between March and June 2020, 454 men and 366 women were assessed on their leadership effectiveness using Harvard's Extraordinary Leader 360-degree assessment. Consistent with HBR's pre-pandemic analysis, they found that women were rated significantly more positively than men. Okay. Comparing overall leadership effectiveness ratings of men versus women, once again, women were rated as more effective leaders with the gap between men and women being even larger during the pandemic. 
women were rated more positively on 13 of the 19 HBR overall leadership effectiveness competencies. Harvard's conclusion is that it is possible that women tend to perform better in a crisis, and perhaps this is true. Perhaps, however, the pandemic has offered a different kind of crisis in need of a different kind of leadership as a drawn-out, data-driven, evolving crisis that impacts our social structures and functions, our healthcare systems, the lives of children, our families, and the elderly in a way that traditional female-oriented traits and tendencies may be more applicable and may be more readily brought to bear. Perhaps it also has to do with Harvard's choice of leadership attributes that seem to me to be more forward-leaning than many of the examples I've previously seen. I don't know the answer, and we absolutely need more women in positions of leadership to test drive the notion that women might be better leaders depending on the situation. I do hope that you'll review the traits that Harvard considered critical for leadership effectiveness so that we can all put as many of them in our toolboxes as possible. Of note, some of the women, some of the some of those traits where women's positive rating was the most higher than the men's and where their differences were statistically significant, again during the pandemic as a crisis, were as follows. Takes initiative, learning agility, inspires and motivates others, develops others, builds relationships, exhibits high integrity and honesty, communicates powerfully and prolifically, and collaboration and teamwork. Driving home why I believe these traits matter, not just for women, but to all of us, I'm going to read to you portions of the article's last paragraph for what I believe are the most significant takeaways. I'm going to leave out some of the details for brevity, but otherwise I will quote, perhaps the most important, sorry, excuse me, perhaps the most valuable part of the data we're collecting throughout the crisis is hearing from thousands of direct reports about what they value and need from leaders now. Based on our data, they want leaders who are able to pivot and learn new skills. Recall my emphasis on style flexing and situational leadership, as well as adding new skills or tools to the toolbox along the way. Further, the last two sentences of the article, article reads as follows. Our analysis shows that these traits that are more, are, that are more often displayed by women, but as the crisis continues, and intensifies in many places, all leaders, regardless of gender, should strive to meet those needs. I knew I was right, but now that Harvard said it, well, maybe it'll get some more attention. And although the article doesn't specifically mention empathy, imposter syndrome, humanity, or the permission to take downtime as traits of extraordinary leaders, give Harvard a break. Perhaps they'll need a little time to catch up, and it's been a busy year for everyone. You know, of course, I'm kidding. And a link to this article will also be provided at the end of the talk. So, you want to be a good leader? Whether in times of crisis or profound change, or not, I believe you can absolutely do so from any level within the organization if you broaden the traditional list of the traits that leaders should possess. And if you happen to be the boss of people, you can model these traits, and you can set them as your expectations for others. I believe that doing so will not only engender more trust from your team and your colleagues, but will foster a working environment that is resilient for when emergencies arise on top of the pandemic. Indeed, they already have. Looking to the future, our teams must be ready and resourced to deploy. So make sure that they are. But recognize also that last year, more than most, has depleted us, our colleagues, and those that we care about. It's time for all leaders, including those within NOAA, to do whatever is needed to build themselves and their teams back up as we see what else 2021 has in store for us. And there is no time to spare. The impacts of climate change, like sea level rise, wait for no one. Not for a vaccine, not for things to settle down, not for runoff elections or our kids to be back in school and not for clumsy, politically driven, climate denying antics. The earth knows better. We know better.
Climate change doesn't wait for any of this. It hasn't waited. And in the last four years, if they've taught me anything about myself and the world around me, is that I've learned that living with change might very well be the new norm. So how can I speak with such confidence about such fundamental uncertainty? Because I'm looking at NOS's data on coral reefs, on sea level rise, on subsidence, on coastal development, on tides and currents, and much else. So what do your data tell you? Which of Earth's signals are you listening to? Because I can tell you, those of us who are listening to the ocean and watching the coast don't have to be convinced. The future is now. Change is happening, and the rate of change is accelerating. We've run out of time for shooting behind the duck, for fighting over turf, and for not using every damn tool in our collective toolbox to prepare for what's to come. Perhaps, ironically, as I come to appreciate NOS as much more than a holding company, I am struck by the fact that I could not have dreamed up a more uniquely and ideally equipped agency to help the American people prepare for coastal change, including the existential threat of sea level rise. I could dream up a larger budget. Of course, we all could. But the bottom line is that NOS has what it takes and that we're working harder than ever to integrate our various tools and to adapt our products and services in tune with a rapidly changing environment. What is your organization poised to do when it comes to preparing for the impact of climate change on agriculture, on fisheries, on tourism, on coastal communities? Are there any things that you do now that will be impacted by climate change? How about coastal change? Do you have the tools and do you know how and when to use them to get ahead of and to communicate these impacts to the public? Preparing for the impacts of climate change is a big, hairy issue. No one agency or industry owns it, although we will all be impacted by it. We all have roles to play, and at NOS, our phones are ringing off the hook with calls from communities, industry, states, and other federal agencies wanting to know what NOS can do to help, particularly when it comes to coastal inundation and resilience. We are answering the calls, but the needs are increasing and changing with each passing day. That's why at NOS we are preparing not just our products and services for what's coming, but we are also beginning to prepare our workplaces and workforces as well. Because in order to support resilience within others, we will need to remain resilient ourselves. For decades, NOS has led NOAA, the states and other federal agencies in coastal resilience. The work has always been difficult, complex, and at times controversial, but the impacts of coastal hazards haven't historically been so widely recognized as impacting so many. Now with stories about the impact of sea level rise pervasive in the media and in conversations on both sides of the political aisle, our work in many respects has just begun. NOS has led coastal resilience efforts with the profound help of others including those with expertise throughout NOAA, partner organizations, academic institutions, as well as other federal and state agencies, municipalities, and industries. Today, we need our partners more than ever. Getting people to make science-based decisions about life along the coast will take more than just data. It will take making the impacts real and compelling for everyone who may have something to contribute or something to lose. This is the business of not just telling people how it is, but how it might be. And this is the business of supporting difficult, life-altering decision-making. This work will take leadership from across NOAA and across the government. Leadership that is inclusive and flexible with an empathetic and humane approach. Within NOS and soon across NOAA, we will be taking steps necessary to advance our thinking on an agency-wide approach to coastal resilience. For example, NOS will be hosting two workshops this spring on coastal resilience and inundation, one for NOS and one for NOAA. The dates of the workshops are not yet set, but more information will be coming soon, and I encourage anyone not directly involved to keep your eyes and ears peeled for workshop results. For those within NOS or NOAA who may attend, I sincerely hope you will find opportunities to support our coastal resilience efforts 
and that you will more fully participate by turning on and turning up the leadership attributes I've discussed today. As a leader of NOS, acting or otherwise, I will continue to encourage and expect our workforce to not only embody these traits, but to display them publicly, overtly, and authentically. I am confident that doing so will help the American people not only believe what our data portends, but act on that data as well. Is the last four years, my first four years, typical in the life of an FDS? Gosh, I hope not. And I hope I didn't scare off any inspiring leaders out there. The future will be difficult, but I'm optimistic that we will bring to it inspired solutions and commitment to success. All the more reason to take an inventory of what's inside each of our toolboxes, share our tools with others, and flex our flexibility so that we are ready for whatever comes our way as the sands continue to shift in all possible directions. And with that, I'll say for one more time and for good measure as a means to seal today's event, thank you and steady as we go. I am so grateful for you amidst so many distractions. I hope you'll have a few uh, questions for me. Robin Sherwinski is going to help us by reading them aloud, so don't be shy. Robin, take it away. Hi, Nicole. Thank you for that wonderful talk on leadership. Um, we've gotten a lot of great questions that have come in during your talk, and we encourage people to continue to submit questions throughout the Q&A portion of this talk. So any questions you have, you can just drop them into that Q&A box on the side of your screen. The first question we'll come up to is Monique Baskin. And Monique Hi, asks, and Monique asks, what is one book that you recommend that helps develop leadership skills? I, I have to admit, that's a tough question for me, Monique. Um, I don't have a good book. I don't get much time to read other than what I read for work. And that's mostly in the last year or so. Um, I have heard of some good books. That's, that's really probably the hardest question I could be asked, quite frankly. Um, because they don't have good examples. I have picked up and put down more leadership books than I can imagine. Um, if I get one, I'll let you know. Great. Thanks, Nicole. Next question comes from Gina Mason, and she asks, what advice do you have for those of us who are mid-career and feeling like they've reached their potential in their current position? Details are great opportunities, but given it is so difficult to get into a supervisory role, what other advice do you have? Yeah, that's a good question, Gina. So um, I have just said yes to a lot of opportunities. Um, I don't know how strategic I was feeling in the moment, but it sounded like a, a, something that would teach me something new, and it sounded like opportunities that I could do some good in. And so what I really had to do, and this is something, I mean, according to my story, right, that I still kind of struggle with, is I would leave my area of specialty and say, okay, I'll go learn about that. What that does is it presents an opportunity for you to learn something totally new. It also is scary, and it also kind of leaves you starting fresh. So you have to pick those opportunities very carefully. Um, they have to be ones where you're absolutely going to get some growth, uh, but they can be scary, and they can leave you really at, at, at the, you know, sort of at the bottom level of expertise, and that can be hard. So I would say, Say yes to opportunities, but, but be thoughtful about the ones you pick. Great advice. Thanks, Nicole. Next up, we have a comment from Walters, and she just wanted to thank you for recognizing the differences in gender identity, for specifically calling out and saying men, women, and everyone in between. Of course. And then we've got another question from Alicia Miller. She said, you talked about the importance of being present in the moment. What techniques or activities keep you grounded to remain present under such challenging and stressful circumstances? Well, I try and work out every day. I also meditate almost every day. I get sleep. I have to get sleep, even if that means I, you know, have to kind of curl up and, and or go, you know, go up to the bedroom at 8 o'clock at night um, to make sure I'm well rested. I 
as much as possible, do not work nights or weekends. It does happen. I would say it's exceedingly rare every several months. Um, and that, that adds to my resilience. It also adds to a sense of sort of like a, a FOMO, like a fear of missing out because I didn't do something that I could have done over the weekend. So it's a constant struggle, but I know for myself I have to step away and fill my life with other pursuits. Great. Thank you, Nicole, so much. Um, another question that we've got came from April Walker, and she said, thank you for making the mention of the difficulty experienced in your role at the hands of your colleagues and those that should not only be in your corner, but assistive in your journey to meeting the mission. Thank you. I agree. Well, next up, we've got a question from um, Monica Youngman, and she asks, what recommendations would you have for leaders to improve the connections and relationships across? Oh gosh, I mean, really, just seeing um, your colleagues as as attributes, um, as a part of a very uh, open and fluid rolodex. Learning about what they do, um, trying to consider. You know, I I will I will absolutely look after NOS's interests first, but never to the exclusion of others. I have to really see what uh, others' interests and, and opportunities for others are. Uh, and I think that is critical. If that's your mindset going in, like, hey, I'd like to get to know what you do and see if I can help you do your job better, um, it can really create a lot of trust and, and inquiry, um, if sincere, can lead to all kinds of possibilities you wouldn't even know exist. Um, so, you know, I, I would just say, Find out what other people are working on and, um, you know, be open to doing what you can to serve a dual mission, yours and theirs. Thank you, Nicole. Next up, we've got a question from Lisa Gethard, and she asks, do you have any silver linings to share from your findings of 2020? Oh, silver linings. Um, I'll tell you who the winner was, uh, the winners in, in, of, of many, and I'm being a little facetious, but the first thing that comes to mind are my feet, um, because I've worn flip-flops for the entirety of the time that we've been in telework. I'm wearing them right now. And so even though I don't really ascribe to, you know, really painful women's shoes, I nothing beats flip-flops, right, or slippers. And I will say my feet are big winners this year. That's a silver lining. I'm spending more time with my husband and my stepdaughter and my dog in our home has been at once you know, a challenge, um, but it's also been a silver lining because now we, you know, sometimes we eat lunch together, sometimes we can just say hi and pop in and see how the other one's doing. Um, that that was not afforded to us before, and so um, I have tried to find a lot of silver linings. I would say those are the two that stand out for me. It's good to find the silver linings where we can. Um, next up, we have a question from John Tarpley, and he asks, when, when you have so many worthy, urgent, and diverse issues to tackle from a broad organization like NOS, what factors do you consider when prioritizing the work and not getting too dynamic? Well, thank you, John. Um, you know, I, I spend a lot of time uh, deferring to office leadership and when it comes to programmatic issues that are really singly within that office's lane. And beyond that, uh, and learning about them, but really listening to what those, that office leadership and those subject matter experts are telling me about how those are priorities. Um, beyond that, and getting to the issue of coastal resilience and, and sea level rise in particular, I think that this is just going to be so important to all of us. Um, and it is naturally, to me, an area where NOS um, can work together uh, and will have impact across the program. There are some programs that will be impacted more or less, um, but the tools that will be brought to bear um, to deal with sea level rise, um, are, there's nuggets throughout all of the offices, whether you're a modeler um, or an engineer or, you know, a conservation person like myself. Um, so I'm really looking for efficiencies <laughs> um, and trying to prepare ourselves for what's next. Um, it is hard to set priorities, and, and I know that I can't do that for each of the offices per se. Um, and I'm not going to pick favorites, and I'm not going to, you know, um, tell them how to run their business. 
Um, but what I've said to all of the office leadership when it comes to coastal change and coastal hazards is that they get to self-identify how important that is to them and, and what they'll bring to the table. But they don't get to say it's not important. So it's sort of having a conversation where I can be clear about my priorities, but then allow that flexibility and that back and forth so we can get to something that makes sense for those other programs. Makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Nicole. Next up, we've got a question from Overbeck, and she asks, do you have any tools for self-assessment, or do you track successes and failures in some way? I, gosh, I, I, I don't. Um, I have my own sort of inner compasses that I listen to, um, and I listen to the voices in my head when they say, ooh, you shouldn't have said it like that, or, hey, try that one again. I try and be as in tune as possible when it comes to interactions with other people by watching body language and, and how they react. The pandemic has made it more difficult um, to do that, and so I've tried to turn up um, the overt questioning, like how's it going, um, how are you doing, how are we doing, um, and really trying to keep that line of communication open in a way that probably didn't seem necessary when we were all together, because I could tell that maybe someone was, I don't know what, really happy with me or bored or whatever it is, and now it's a little harder to, to discern. And so um, I just had to find a way to make that assessment more active and more overt. It is really hard to say, oh, I won at that, or I scored at that, or I, or I lost at this, this time. Um, so, and again, I'm not doing it necessarily for me only. I'm doing it for an entire organization. So talking to the programs, talking to the leadership and the staff, and if, if they're, you know, honestly, I spend a lot of time saying, tell me about it, right? And if I don't have any real problems with what I've heard, I'll say, what would you like to do? And then that way we're able to, you know, have a real good dialogue about what, what is important and whether we succeeded. Um, but you have, you, have to be, you have to be active in it, right? You have to be engaged in it. You can't just assume that you're succeeding or failing, even when you're doing it by instinct. It's instinct. Um, but I wish I had a better measure. I wish I was, you know, quantitative about it, but I'm not sure when I would do that. <laughs> Thank you for your question, though. Something to think about. Great. Thanks, Nicole. Next up from Peyton Robin, Robertson, he asks, or he says, excellent lessons learned and application of leadership to your experiences, Nicole. Then he asks, can you give us a recent challenging example of when you've applied style, Ooh, style testing flexing. to achieve so, yeah. a successful result? Um, well, and this is possibly more than style flexing, but one of the things, and Robin knows this well, we've, we've employed throughout the 2020 at least, were um, the application of kind of fun events at NOS, um, opportunities for people to continue to network um, either through virtual trivia events or virtual holiday events, um, you know, virtual happy hours, like whatever, um, to give people an, or, and luncheons and and even listening sessions and safe space discussions. And those aren't those aren't meant to be trivial or fun, um, but they do they do call upon us to be a little different. We have to either be a more active listener um, or we have to be more, um, you know, uh, planned about what we cover um, or, or how we take on other people's input. Um, maybe we have to be funny. Maybe we want to be silly or, um, you know, it, it has really required me to, to ask myself, what do I think people want? What would be good for them right now? And if that's talking, I talk. If it's listening, I listen. If it's being silly, I do my best to be silly. Um, and that's just sort of the approach that we've taken. Um, and thank goodness that I have the comfortability to do that. That doesn't mean it's not nerve-wracking, um, but I feel like it works for at least some subset of the NOS population. And as a result, I'll I'll, you know, find the courage to lean into those situations and, and you know, like be here today. Um, it's not easy and it takes work and it takes time and courage and practice. But if I think it's useful, then I'll figure out if I've got that tool in my toolbox. Thanks, 
Thanks, Nicole. We are coming up here on 3 o'clock. Um, we've got plenty of questions still coming in, and we'll keep asking some questions of you, Nicole. To everyone who's watching, thank you so much for all of your great questions. We'll try and get through as many as we can, but we might not be able to get to all of them today. Um, but the next question we have is from Kara Raj Rajveller. And Kara asks, in a workplace where empathy and collaboration <laughs> is thought of as the Sometimes you have to be kind of, um, um, I don't know how to say it, like sneaky about it. You know, again, making it about um, what other people need and other people's interests is a great way to get them to collaborate with you. And look, I spent almost 12 years doing international negotiations for treaties. And so, um, you know, completely honestly with you, there's a, there's a fine line between, um, you know, trying to be persuasive and being manipulative of other people. And I really think that your intention and your transparency of your intention is the difference between those. And so I don't mean to sound like you're tricking them into collaborating with you, but if you're clear that you want to understand their interests with a capital I and, and see what you can do to help them meet those interests, you'll get collaborators left and right. And sometimes, depending on the situation, trust takes time. Um, but you're... And, and I think you know this, there's, there's leading from within the organization and there's leading at the top of an organization, right? Any one of us can be leaders. And I'd like to think, you know, with rose-colored glasses that I've had leadership traits throughout no matter what my position has been. Um, positional authority is one, of the, is one of the weakest, you know, attributes that I have as a leader to use. And so I think really trying to get people to... Um, to open up about their interests and understand yours uh, is, is really a great way to not just move up, but be viewed as a leader within the eyes of your colleagues. You'll be surprised if they, how quickly they will come to you to collaborate on the next project or might consider you to be on a team with them or to lead a team that they are working on because they have learned that you are collaborative and that you're looking out for everyone's interests. Thanks, Nicole. Next question comes from Nicole Kinsman, and she asks, what are your thoughts on the possibilities of NOAA leadership models that are more geographically distributed, both informed by our collective COVID experience and also beyond yeah, thank the you, opportunity? Nick. Um, that's a great question. NOAA is actually uh, is starting an initiative called the Future of the Workforce. Um, or the future of work, uh, and it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. I do think there will there are a lot of things that we miss. We absolutely miss, you know, getting together and going to conferences, or we miss um, that that personal connection that we have when we're together. Uh, but there are a lot of things we've learned that we can do without and do our jobs quite well. I remember in the early months of being at home because of the pandemic, you know, sort of the national language is that the government was closed. And I remember sitting in my home just like, the government is not closed. We're all working. We just don't happen to be in the office. Um, and we've, we've moved past that, uh, and that's a good thing. I don't know what, what is in store for us next. I do think that we need to think about what are the things that we miss still, right? Um, what are the things that are still hamstringing us um, by working remotely or by um, being dispersed? Um, and what are the things we don't? You know, I, I predict that as much as I have wanted to go back for so many reasons, and as much as I hope we hope we can get everyone vaccinated soon and be safe to go back into the office, I also believe that the longer we're out of the office and effective, as I mean, I can only speak for NOS, but we're rocking and rolling at NOS. We are doing mission. Um, the longer we go the more open I believe we will be to asking ourselves, what do we really need to get back to? And I don't know what the answers to those questions will be, but I am excited and have no problem uh, having those questions because I think it's only fair, whether it's carbon footprint or um, the cost to the government of just of so many people in offices and um, how expensive that is, or in the case of NOS, um, how many of our people and facilities have to be along the coast? 
right? The coasts are, it's going to be wicked different here coming soon. And so um, some of us need to be on the coast. Some of us don't. And maybe, you know, the next generation of our workforce wants to live near the mountain, right? So we'll have to figure that out. Um, and yeah, I, I look forward to doing it, but I can't, I can't, my crystal ball, um, as some have heard me say, my crystal ball has turned into a snow globe. So I don't really know what's coming next, but I think that we should really have those conversations. I appreciate you asking me. Great. Thank you so much, Nicole. Uh, next, we've got a question from David Zadda here, and he says, it is so refreshing to hear an honest and personal take on leadership. What I don't think I know what else to do. <laughs> um, yeah, I really, I really don't think I know what else to do. I have had kind of a, um, a compass or a, I don't know what you would call it, kind of a guiding principle for as long as I can remember that if I think something I can do or a place I can be or a job I can hold, if I think I can be effective at that and if I think I can help there doing that thing, then I just do it. And it kind of puts self after service. You know, when I came into the federal government, I was like, this is for me um, because, you know, it's never been about, never been about the next job or the next promotion or anything. It's not to say I didn't want to, I didn't have ambition. I actually did have ambition, I still do. But it's all about what I can do to affect change and positive change. And so, you know, I think I just kind of ask, will it help? You know, and if the answer is yes, or I think the answer is yes, and maybe I'll ask others to, um, you know, give me input on that, then I just try and do it. And I, you know, sometimes when I answer questions like this, it feels like my, my style is very ad hoc, um, and maybe it is. I think sometimes we can spend too much time in our heads. Um, but I, I just try and do whatever I think is going to help. Um, even if, even if it, you know, I have to build a new skill or learn a new thing to do that. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> I think it did. Thanks, Nicole. Um, next up, we've got a question from Paula Jones Yates, and Paula asks for you to elaborate a bit more. On Hi, Paula. Like Good question. Um, yeah, I, it is not lost on me, although I'm still trying to figure out what it means that both of the, the first job and the last job uh, I applied for on a dare. Um, I think that some of that has to do with um, my tendency to stay very focused on the task at hand. Um, and I've had a lot of mentors over the years say, hey, you should pick your head up. You've been in that job for a few years. Or, hey, have you thought about doing this other thing? Or just flat out recruit me. Um, in the case of these two jobs, I did kind of get, not dared, but sort of egged on by colleagues, you should apply for this job. Um, and, I, and, I, and I wonder sometimes if I can be, not too focused, but if my focus on a succeeding at a particular task can over time kind of blind me to the opportunities that are out there, or if just other people see something in me that I don't, see some potential, like, hey, I think you'd be good at that. Um, and, and maybe I was good at what I was already doing, but it, it, it's usually not been me that says, oh, I kind of want to do something else, um, which is it's just one of my tendencies. But yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to make of that. Um, I don't usually go for dares, which is funny because these two big decisions were made on a dare. Um, but I am very, very grateful for my mentors and friends and family and colleagues that will ask me questions about what I want to do next uh, because I tend not to. I tend to focus on what I'm doing at the time. Great. Thanks, Nicole. Caitlin O'Brien asks, what are some specific ways that you work to empower your Yeah, team? for sure. Um, I have had one recently um, where I, I, I trust the team, I respect the team, I trust everything about you know, what, they, what they're doing and what they do, 
Um, but the situation that they were put in made, you know, basically their product something that we would not, you know, have, have wanted to be advancing at a certain time frame. And that makes it really hard because then I have to accept the fact that a decision that I believe is good for them and good for the program and good for the organization in the short term is going to be disappointing and frustrating and aggravating potentially to them. Um, and also, and I'll, and I'll add something to that, that at this level, if they are frustrated and disappointed and aggravated, I may or may not ever know, right? So if I have an inkling that I could be wading into something that's difficult or against the grain or against the decision of recommendation of, of one of my teams, then it is on me to act. Because they may or may not tell me. That is my responsibility. And I, I could blissfully sit around and go, oh, I'm sure they'll tell me if they're upset with me. But th that may not be the case. And so, you know, entering into those decisions where it's kind of against the grain or against the recommendation, it's very rare that I do that. It is very rare. Um, it's just, it, the NOS teams are just so good. Um, like I said before, I will say, explain it to me. Help me understand it, and and you know nine and a half times out of ten I go with their recommendation. But every once in a while, I have to do something differently. Um, I don't take pleasure in it, but I have to stay confident that the lens through which I was looking is the right one. Um, and I and I will say, having been on the other side of the fence, right? Having been that staffer, um, that subject matter expert, or whatever that is that works so hard around the clock, or for five years to do something, um, I know what it feels like, and I know I, I know what it feels like to have my recommendation, you know, decline. Um, I, I I know what it feels like to have the rationale explained to me, and what it feels like to not have the rationale explained to me. And I would much rather be told no, and have it explained to me. And so I will always be open to explaining my decisions, particularly to people that busted their butts to get something done. Um, and that's not to say, come convince me otherwise, but it is to say I will be responsible for my own rationale and I'll be transparent with that because I think we all deserve that. Very true, Nicole. Um, we've gotten several different questions from many people that I'm going to kind of roll into one big question here. Um, and it's uh, asking about leadership development opportunities. So most folks seem to be aware of the LCDC program within NOAA that you mentioned. But are there other leadership development opportunities either within NOAA or yeah, NOAA? It, it, and I get that would... question a lot. Um, and we and we have the mentor program. Uh, and you know, I think um, uh, I know at NOS we're working on some other ideas as well. I I would say that. For me, whilst I did uh, participate in the LCDC and it was fantastic for me, most of my detail assignments were ones that I created for myself. Um, and I know that can be difficult and you need to have a strong relationship with your supervisor in order to engage in those kind of conversations. Um, but it, it has been more impactful for me to be outside of a structured leadership opportunity than a structured one. Um, Again, LCP was great, but by the time I got to the LCP, I had done several detail, excuse me, and I participated in the advanced studies program at, uh, at when I worked for fisheries as well. So, you know, I have been, I have, I have had several conversations with people that have wanted to talk about this, and I know it can be difficult for some to ask their supervisor, can I do a detail, can I do, um, you know, can I be that acting person while somebody else goes out on maternity leave or whatever it is? Um, I, I think, you know, from the conversations that I've had, it seems like a lot of the challenge starts with just not a really robust relationship with your supervisor. And I know from personal experience how hard that can be, I'm not going to name names, but I've had my challenges. Um, and I would say work at that as much as you can. Um, because they, they can, they won't be your best advocate. That'll be you. But they can be your next best advocate. Um, you can also 
shadow NOAA leaders anytime. If anyone turns you down for a shadow, don't accept it. Um, it's super easy. <laughs> don't accept the no. Ask somebody else. Um, shadowing is a wonderful way to see leadership in action. You can do informational interviews. You can do informal mentorship if the mentor program is not for you. Um, I know that, that it, I, I do believe, and I have talked to the LTP, you know, uh, organizers and, and founders and stuff about this, that the LTDP's best attribute and sort of the, the darker side of it is it's an elite group. Right? So if you're in it, it's like, yay, I'm in it, it's so awesome. If you're not in it, it's kind of not awesome. So providing more opportunities um, is something I think Noah has tried to do. But I would also encourage you to just be creative on your own. Develop an IDP, for example. Um, it's been incredibly important for me um, before I got into SES to do that. So um, I hope that's helpful. Um, but sometimes you just have to be your best advocate and, and be creative. Great advice. Thanks, Nicole. Next up, we have a question from Tina Lee. And she says, thank you for out outlining the traits of inclusive. How do I respond? It depends. Um, on uh, the, you know, the things that I mentioned earlier, how, how well rested I am, right? how resilient I am in that moment, they can stress me out. Um, and I absolutely sometimes um, have a hard time figuring out how to navigate that situation or that person. Um, I can sort of feel myself like calling on, like opening up my whole toolbox like inside my head, right? like spilling all the tools on the table. Um, and trying to figure out what's going to work here. Uh, and, and honestly, in those moments, if I, I get too kind of frantic about it, it, it's probably better that I not engage in that moment and take a pause and think about it. Um, and I, being a broken record, you know, getting back and trying to understand why someone is engaging a certain way, um, not because we can figure out other psychology, and I wouldn't even try to, um, but understanding their interests, what do they have to gain here? What do they have to lose here? Um, and if you can talk to that person and learn more about those things, I think you should. Um, it, is, it is challenging. I mean, I think that each of the members of the NOAA leadership team, for example, are very different humans. They're very different creatures. They behave really differently. Um, but I think some of the combined factors that I mentioned earlier, you know, being a woman and being fairly younger, um, and with, with being fairly younger, naturally comes being less experienced, right? That, that's fine. I own that. Um, it, makes it, it makes it challenging to figure out um, how to navigate some of the more difficult um, situations I find myself in. Uh, and I don't think I always do a great job, uh, but I keep trying and I keep getting up and um, learning from each one. So it, yeah, I think really just trying to understand others' interests as best you can. Um, if you can ask them, ask them, right, and see what you can find out. Um, but if someone makes things difficult for you, um, you know, there may be something that you're not aware of that you could learn um, about why that might be the case. I don't know. Try. All right. Next up, Nicole, we've got a question from Gib Hartley. And Gib says, what are some questions or techniques used to invite others into decision making who have historically been excluded? This yeah, that's a good question. And, and some of those attributes that you just listed are ones that I might not know and it's none of my business. And right. And so, so checking, again, difficult, more difficult during COVID times, but um, Checking the body language, asking, does anyone have any other thoughts on this? Um, you know, one one uh, trick that I don't do as well as other people that I've seen do is sort of when you start a meeting, uh, very briefly sort of indicating the expertise that every person in the room is bringing to that meeting. Um, so everyone kind of level sets on why the others are there. And I'm, I forget to do that. Um, I think I think really kind of paying attention to those that don't right, as well as those that do speak. Um, and there can be a, a lot of reasons 
as to why a person is more reserved with a meeting, good, bad. Um, you know, it could be a lot of reasons for that. Um, but if you don't hear from them, um, you definitely don't know what they're thinking. Um, and you may find, as I have, particularly in the lesson I learned when I was doing a lot of treaty negotiation, is I would think I had consensus because, say, five out of seven people were in vehement agreement and the other two didn't say much, right? Well, guess what? Those two people voted against me or those two countries voted against me. So it's very important to understand that silence does not mean, yes, I agree. Um, and it could mean a whole host of things. It absolutely does not mean that that person feels heard. Um, and so it's worth investigating that. Um, and, you know, one of the things I try and do is a little different um, answer to your question, but I encourage um, our office leadership to uh, send uh, subject matter experts and more junior staff to briefings with me so that people can interact with me and them um, and can see how the meetings are run and can have an opportunity to have input, um, even if they're not the big wigs uh, that are making decisions. I think that was really important to my development to be in the room when decisions were being made. Um, and I try and encourage that as well. And I hope that that's bringing a, a, a certain level of confidence and competence to them so that when it's time for them to voice their opinion, that they will be heard. Um, I, I don't think I do anything overtly different if there is a woman or a person of color or if I know someone is LGBTQ+. Plus. Um, I don't, I don't, I suspect that I don't do that, but I do suspect that I try and make sure that everyone's heard. And, you know, if I see people talking over people, I get talked over. Um, that's not cool. You know, I'll make a mental note of that and say, hey, you know, I think, I think Tracy was trying to say something. Can we come back to her or can we, you know, whatever that is. Um, so now when it comes to, I'll say, acknowledgement of input into decision making, Right? I will ask, who are the stakeholders? Who are the user groups, for example? Right? Who will this decision impact? What's your decision horizon? Right? How far is your decision horizon? The further it gets, the harder it is to see those people. So if you ask those questions about who will be impacted my decision, who is the end user of this product, then, and what are their interests, then you pull your decision uh, horizon closer to you, and then you can realize, oh, we left that native group out, or we didn't even talk to that industry, or you know what, this is an impoverished area of the country. We have not even talked to those communities, right? And so, I, you know, that's another way we do it on those kinds of situations. Thanks for sharing those Thanks for insights, Nicole. Next up, you've got a question from Kia. That's a great question. So, um, truth be told, um, I had a professional coach. Um, uh, well, I've had, let me start with mentorship. I've had mentors throughout my career. All of them were informal, right? All of them were me reaching out and having a relationship. And, and my style, none of those, none of those initial conversations sounded like, will you be my mentor? Right? That sounds maybe to some people that are super busy, like, oh, that's going to take a lot of time. But if I just reach out to someone that I know has insights into, you know, you know his work or leadership or whatever that is, then I can just say, hey, would you mind chatting with me next week? I was just wondering, you know, over lunch or coffee or whatever. And that usually gets you a yes, right? Um, and, you know, as, as Robin knows and as others who, who pay attention to my calendar, I have calls periodically with people that used to work for NOAA, that still work for NOAA, that, you know, people that never worked for NOAA because I respect their opinions. Um, and they help me as sort of a sounding board. Um, you know, it's not to say I call them and say, what should I do about this particular NOAA decision? But I, you know, I can give them some general information and they can help me kind of come to conclusions um, or can offer me advice for my own personal development. And so, I absolutely have had mentors, um, mostly, um, you know, as I say, old white dudes. They've been great. Um, I wish I'd had more female leadership and uh, possibilities and more people of color possibilities, but that's not been afforded to me, particularly at NOAA. 
Um, but I have learned a lot and I still continue to learn. I heard from a mentor today. Um, and, you know, she was reaching out actually to um, ask for another woman leader's contact information. And I said, sure, I'll give it to you, but how about we chat next week, right? So, you know, you can just kind of do that and, and have people stay on, uh, have you stay on their radar screen. Um, and in terms of with his mentorship and what else? Now I've forgotten Robin. I know, poor Robin. Mentorship. Oh, executive coach. So I did have an executive coach, um, and um, I think she's wonderful and uh, have a great relationship. But it wasn't it wasn't the kind of coaching that I felt like I needed, and I was going through so much turbulence and change in my life at the time um, that I just said I got to stop. I'm not in a place right now where I'm going to absorb all these new leadership techniques. Um, and I think that was the right decision for me. I kind of needed a break. Um, I have more recently picked up a new executive coach. Um, we've only met twice, so I don't know how well it's going to turn out. Um, but I need someone who is really going to be open to um, uh, not only hearing what is important to me as a leader, um, but also giving me the tough, uh, some people call it tough love, but tough advice and probe questions. And so I don't, you know, in my position, if I say something like, well, this is the way it is, people may or may not tell me differently, right? I need an executive coach to say, well, hold on, let me probe that, right? And they could be challenging me in a way that allows me to remain open to that challenge um, and that really kind of gets to the heart of the matter. I also want an executive coach, and I think I'll have one in this case, that really doesn't know Noah, you know, that doesn't know the people I'm talking about, that doesn't know the issues, um, that's coming at it only with my success in mind. Um, and I will say that um, I think having an executive coach is, is, or some mentorship along the way, is absolutely critical um, because we have to feel like there's other people out there that are thinking of, of our success. Um, and it, that doing so and thinking about our success is not selfish, um, but absolutely um, what we should be doing to just continue, continue forward. Thanks, Nicole. And for everyone who's still on, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we've gotten so many great questions that have come in, and we're sorry that we can't get to all of them here today. Um, we'll try and follow up with you as we can. But one last question for Nicole before we wrap it up. There's no, Linda, come on. There's no way I can answer that question. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't even know that I was on a path, right? It's just been so windy. Um, there are times in my career that have been, I'll say, more fun than others, that have been more interesting than others. Um, I, I cannot live with any kind of thing that feels like regret, um, because then I think I would have to come to terms with the fact that I have not like been scripting my whole career out, which I haven't been. Um, no, I wouldn't do it any differently. Um, I mean, individual things that I did or said, yeah, absolutely. Um, there are times when I, I wasn't the best person that I, that I had hoped I could be, or the best leader, or the best performer, or whatever. Um, but in terms of those big choices to take uh, detail assignments or to take chances, like the Deepwater Horizon chance, um, I mean, that was wild, um, completely out of my league and depth. Um, there's no way I would trade that for the world. Um, so, no, I wouldn't do anything differently. But I will say, in a parallel universe, I feel like there's another one of me out there having all different detail assignments um, and maybe ending up at the same place, you know. I haven't prepared any final words. I will just say thank you to everyone who's hung in there with us this whole time. Um, and thank you to Robin for being the most excellent uh, moderator of questions. Um, one of the uh, best uh, benefits, the best benefits of being at this level 
is that you get the opportunity to work with someone like Robin. And so thank you, Robin, um, for everything you do to keep me um, in the right location, saying the right things at the right time. Um, and thank you to everyone, seriously, who joined. And, um, you know, this has been great. Um, please, um, you know, I, I, if I say keep in touch, then Robin will feel me, right? Because then we'll, like, um, have to do this once a week. Anyway, hang in there, everybody. These are tough times, and, um, and we got this. Great. Nicole, thank you so much. And Robin, you did a terrific job moderating. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Our next seminar in the NOAA Environmental Leadership Seminar Series will be on Tuesday, February 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, featuring, featuring Irene Parker, Assistant Chief Information Officer for the NESDIS ACIO Office. So we look forward to joining you joining us then. And as you leave today, you'll be taken to a, UR, a uh, link that Nicole wanted you to see. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. Take care. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Nicole. Bye-bye.